everyone and welcome to another exciting edition of Founders Meetup, the virtual edition. Uh, we're joined in today by everyone, but mainly Ryan Hayes, who will be talking today about intrapreneurship, not to be confused by entrepreneurship. And it's actually a subject that I'm personally very excited to learn more about because of the stage of where our company is at right now, it's definitely the time to start looking into different growth opportunities and stuff like that. And I think that is a really awesome subject. So thank you for joining us, Ryan. I do have some questions to kind of get us started, but before I do, could you, you know, please tell us who you are, what's your background and what is your experience with entre intrapreneurship? Mm. <laughs> yeah, uh, so hey everybody, uh, I'm Ron Hayes. Uh, I'm actually from Wise, Virginia. Uh, it's about an hour from here, really small town. So my background is uh, software development and um, I knew kind of really, really early on in, in college that I wanted to do some sort of software development, mostly because I played a lot of Halo and I wanted to, uh, you know, work on, work on video games. So oh, uh, I did software development professionally through, through college. Um, went to grad school, George Mason, uh, up in DC, got a job at a small consulting firm there and, um, had the really great opportunity to work with a ton of different, you know, small, smaller businesses, but also really big businesses, uh, AOL, Toyota, uh, discovery channel, working on some of the biggest sites on, uh, the internet. And, uh, after, after I worked there for a few years, me and my wife started dating, um, and she's from here. So I had to make the decision to, you know, either move back, move back home where there's much less, uh, opportunity, especially like 10, you know, 10 years ago for a software developer, um, or, you know, stay in there in DC and doing all kinds of stuff. Um, and so I decided to get a job here, move back. There was one job on like monster.com or something. And, you know, so I applied for it, got the developer job, moved back. It was awesome. Got my first day at work and it was, it was a terrible job. Like I hated it. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was so bad. And so kind of what I, what I had to make the decision of is like, do I just sort of stay in this job or uh, is there something that I could do to, you know, make the job that I want? So I started uh, writing articles on the internet and sort of building up my personal brand and eventually, um, I started to freelance. And so, um, I did that at night. And then after, you know, a year or two, I ended up starting to do that full time. And I did that full time for about, you know, six or six or seven years. Um, and had, you know, again, the, the great opportunity with working with tons of different organizations, um, largely on Greenfield apps, which Greenfield, uh, as opposed to Brownfield, Greenfield means that it's a new, new product, either uh, a totally new product or some sort of new feature. It's not maintenance on something that's existing. And so um, I worked with, um, uh, worked in healthcare, built a new like HIPAA compliant chat application that was, you know, something, something new that was inside of a larger organization doing building a new product, just like a startup would, um, except it's inside of an organization. And so I worked on a lot of those, those types of things. Uh, we started having kids and um, I kind of, I'm, I'm, I tend to work a lot. And so um, when I'm working for myself, I tended to kind of want to just work all the time. Uh, and I had never had the opportunity to do non-consulting, non-contract work. And uh, one day, um, a guy that I know who's, who's from here, uh, Alan Browder, went to the .NET software developer meetup, um, knew him for a long time. He asked me if I wanted to, wanted to work with him. And I said, yes, because um, I, I really just want that, wanted that opportunity, what it feels like to be inside of a product company and not, not coming in it from you know, an outside view, not a contractor, like actually working on the team. And, um, so, uh, so, so for context, the, um, the company that I work for, we build uh, school cafeteria software. So it's a bunch of different 
products that all sort of work in tandem uh, together, but they're sold individually. So there's point of sale. There's a back office for like ordering and inventory um, of all the food that comes through the cafeteria. Um, we have like a digital signage product, like you go into McDonald's and there's like all the different signs that shows the menu and that kind of thing. And so those are sold individually, but also work together, you know, as a, as a group. And um, one of the things that I've always done um, is I've been interested in the business side of, of things. The business side of software is something that I find uh, just as interesting as, as the code part. And uh, so whenever I moved back here, it's kind of evident in that I worked with uh, Startup Weekend uh, here in the Tri-Cities. I worked with uh, Jose on uh, Will to Scale, which was like a bunch of people. We went and it's almost like a, like a weekend hackathon, right? Like everybody gets in a room, they think of an idea and then they build something in 24 or 48 hours. And then they have, uh, you know, uh, a presentation at the end. Well, we all just got in a cabin and just, we pitched to each other and we picked the best idea and we worked on it. Um, and that was, that was so fun. Uh, you know, great, great learning opportunity. And uh, inside of my current organization, you know, again, we're a product company. Our parent company is a payments processor. So they, they their core business model is they take payments and then they also sell software. Um, and so they take, you know, you get money from selling the software, but then you also take a cut from each of the payments. So that's sort of for context, that's, that's their, their business model. And they have this, uh, this thing internally called uh, Ship It, which is an internal hackathon. If you think about uh, entrepreneurship, I guess it's like, you know, innovation in, inside of an organization. Um, and so Ship It happens every year. And uh, it's, you, you think of an idea and you can work on whatever you want. But uh, the judges are, um, are executives within the organization. So there's people from marketing and product. Uh, customer service, uh, sales, engineering, all that kind of stuff. And so the first year uh, that we entered, uh, we ended up won winning the competition. It was um, um, uh, an extra feature onto our existing product. And then the, the next year they were having some issues around, uh, there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of customers who would just not do things correctly through the course of the year. And then at the end of the year, they would try to close out the year and then all their financials would be, you know, in bad shape. Uh, and so we built basically a red light, green light system um, that bolted onto our, our existing product to sort of uh, figure out some things that weren't necessarily errors in the product, but were sort of red flags that you could figure out early um, and then give our people a heads up uh, to, sort of address the address those things early before they become uh, bigger problems. And so we won both of those years. Uh, they then decided to not do cash prizes, uh, I guess, because we kept winning <laughs> so much. Uh, then, when, then the next year happened. Um, and so what we built um, ended up becoming, you know, uh, part, part of our product on, on the back end side of things. And then uh, COVID-19, of course, hit, right? And uh, which is a big issue, especially in, in schools, because our, our business is, uh, is schools. And so mm -hmm. when schools are disrupted, that is a huge problem, right? And everybody looks at that and they're like, this is, this is super, super terrible. And it really kind of is because it throws a wrench in everything that's, that's stable. And if you think about the difference between um, you know, a startup and an organization as it grows, the problem that you sort of get into um, is what we call like the innovator's dilemma, mm -hmm. right? Like when you're first, first starting out, you're sort of used to change and you don't have, you don't necessarily have investors, you don't have numbers to hit, you don't have growth numbers and revenue numbers that you have to hit uh, every single year. So there's a lot of incentive to really maintain that, right? It's a ratchet as you, as you build an organization and grow it bigger and bigger. And so um, COVID-19 sort of forced us and a lot of people, if you really think about it, to, to become startups um, when it, they're not really incentivized regularly to, to do that. Uh, and so what we, what we did is um, we sort of started to brainstorm various different ideas. 
And we were like, okay, well, you know, we can't rely on historical data in schools to, um, to, to know how much macaroni and cheese to, to order for a particular mm -hmm. day. Because if the, you know, if the cases go up, we might not have school that day. But also, even if we do have school, certain parents may be like, well, I'm definitely not sending my kid to school. Uh, so there's no real way to use historical data. And then also, um, the, the country as a whole, there's small schools, right? Like very, very small, 100, 100 people, maybe 200, 200 people in them. And then there's Chicago, which has like 600 some schools in their district, right? And there's it, there are ton, tons. It's, it's, it's a huge, uh, huge org organization. And then everything in between, and nobody really knows what, the, what they're going to do. Um, and so what we decided to do was um, build sort of a pre-ordering, almost like, almost like DoorDash, I guess, for, for schools. Mm -hmm. So it's a meal ordering system. And uh, so parents can pick what they want and what days that their kids are going to go to school. And then back office can get, um, you know, understand how many orders that they, um, that are coming in, how much mm -hmm. of each thing that they need to make, how to get it to the, the kids, all that kind of stuff. Um, the problem, of course, is that it's now what, like July, all, you know, so, and school starts when, like a month and something. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so we're, we're effectively now building, we went from idea to we're going to ship it in, you know, sept, early September, probably the fall, the fall. So we're in true, true startup, uh, territory. Uh, and so it's been really interesting to, uh, to be able to, to work on that. But really we were kind of talking about this before, before everybody joined is that the entrepreneurship, I, I kind of feel like that's not even a real word, mm -hmm. right? Like, you're like, oh, right. Hey, is this is an entrepreneur. Like, that's not a thing. Like, and I think really a lot of people know that, that it's just, it's sort of marketing how it's like a word that couldn't make it into the dictionary and it hired like a crack marketing team to like, can you make me into a real word? Um, <laughs> I, uh, and the, the problem I, I really feel like is that uh, we're looking for entrepreneurs, Right, but really, entrepreneurship and honestly, entrepreneurship um, in the business world isn't anything special. It's really just good business, right? It's you. You want to be focused on the customer, and at the end of the day, you really want to bring as much value as possible to your customer. So much value that they will give you money for it, mm -hmm. right? Like that's that's the core the core of business, and. Uh, what makes a really great entrepreneur a great entrepreneur is having that laser focus on the customer, but also, uh, you know, understanding all of the different parts of business, not necessarily being a, an expert at, you know, finances, like I'm not an accountant, but I understand numbers a little bit, you know, yeah. enough, enough to make decent decisions. I'm not a marketing person. Um, I'm not a salesperson, but I understand if, you know, something would not, not sell or, you know, cause some sort of like PR issue. Um, and uh, the other aspect is really relationships, right? If you're an entrepreneur, you have to wear a ton of hats, but also one of, one of the superpowers of really great entrepreneurs is that they're well-connected. And not just connected for connection's sake, right? Like having real relationships with people enough to where you can go talk to them and have coffee with with people if you have uh, if you have an idea or real real problems. Uh, you know, if I have any sort of issue, like I cannot think of an issue that I would that I would have that probably most of you all on the call, like Jose or or Jeff or David or Roe, like I would know somebody to get in touch with. Um, or at least know somebody who they would know that I could get in touch with. And inside of a large organization, it's really easy for people um, at, at any, any level, really. But a lot of times, like uh, as an engineer, for example, it's really easy to get focused on your, your, like your one little piece of the world. And that's good. But don't let that uh, sort of detract from your, knowing where your your piece fits in uh, mm -hmm. with with the larger world, I think one one thing that 
Heartland does really, really great is fostering relationships across departments. So as a software developer, um, sometimes I get pulled into various different, uh, different meetings just to get exposure um, that may be totally optional and I could just decline it. Um, but it gives me the opportunity to be able to understand what's going on with product, what's going on with customer service and sales and uh, other pieces of the organization. And really at the end of the day, that helps bring me, even though I'm working on, you know, software and mm -hmm. in quote unquote the back, um, it helps me bring me closer to the customer. And if you want to bring value to somebody, the farther away that you get from them, it becomes way harder to bring value uh, to them. Even though it, you know, features and those types of things come filter through product and it's already sort of vetted. Um, it, it energizes me when I know that what I'm doing makes a difference uh, to, to the customer. Mm -hmm. So no matter who your customer is, if it's a business customer or maybe your, you know, internal ops inside of the organization and your real customer is like me, a developer, like I write a program and I give it to ops and they, you know, put it up on a server somewhere. And now it's a, it's a web app or, or website. Like I'm their, I'm their customer. And uh, you know, whenever you have sort of, sort of tension um, between dev and ops or any part, any internal part of the organization, when everybody aligns on, on the customer, whoever that is, it really starts to sort of break down barriers. Um, and I think that's something that, uh, I've learned here recent, recently is, uh, is crucial and extremely valuable um, to making really great products uh, mm -hmm. is really just relationships inside of organizations and as leaders uh, facilitating those relationships and, um, and just bringing people closer, closer to the customer uh, through that. Mm -hmm. That's sweet. And uh... It's like you've done a really great job at answering a lot of the questions that I had written down for you. So great job on that. Uh, but one thing I do want to ask is, so I, before this, I did some research and try to find like a good definition for the non-word entrepreneurship. <laughs> and it's like one that I found was, which was good. It said the term entrepreneurship refers to a system that allows an employee to act like an entrepreneur within a company or other organization? And I guess my question would be, with your job right now and this new stuff that you're creating, mm -hmm. in what ways would you say you feel like you're an entrepreneur within a larger company? Yeah, so um, in a lot of ways, entrepreneurs swim in sort of a sea of uncertainty uh, a lot. Um, so when you're, when you're first starting out, you're not just trying to bring value to your customer. Sometimes you're trying to figure out who your customer is, right? You don't even know, you don't even know that sometimes. Um, and with, with, with our situation, you know, we don't know what school is going to look like, um, you know, school as it has been for a very long time is suddenly not going to be that way. Mm -hmm. So we don't, even our existing customers that we have, uh, you know, we, we don't know how they're going to react or act or how old behaviors that we, you know, typically could say like we, that we count on, um, that w there's no guarantee of that. And so there's a lot of, a lot of uns uncertainty in this. Um, another thing that's different between organiza big organizations and, and, you know, smaller startups um, is sort of this, uh, this, this incentive that, uh, you know, as larger organizations get bigger, it's tougher to build a new product. Um, but in, the, in this particular situation, our hand was kind of forced. And it's funny because this sort of pre-ordering thing actually was a ship it project a couple of years ago. So it's like, oh, if we had just like greenlit that mm -hmm. we would have it. Right. Um, but it's uh, yeah. So there's just, there's just a lot of, 
lot of uncertainty. And typically with larger organizations, if you're building a totally new product, it's very rare, mostly because uh, it's cheaper to, uh, to acquire a startup who is doing something similar. So like we do, uh, you know, cafeteria, point of sale, that kind of thing. And if somebody had a product that was pretty, pretty close, um, it's usually cheaper to just buy that organization because you get the existing customers too. You can mm -hmm. integrate their cus those customers in with your existing products. And it's sort of um, like we have all of the, you know, four or five different products and you can buy those individually, but uh, each of those are almost like a gateway drug, right? So if you buy one product and then you're like, okay, this is a really good meal ordering. I can figure out, you know, how, how I, how many things to make and kids can buy things online and pick them up at the school. But if it integrates with the point of sale, the back office, the ordering and inventory, then everything starts to become better. So it's a huge opportunity for big organizations uh, to be able to, um, to, to integrate those products in with existing ones and make a lot of money. But um, it's also tougher to like what we're doing is mm -hmm. building something totally new because it's a lot of investment, right? You don't know if it's going to work. We don't even know, like when we first started, we were like, okay, well maybe, maybe COVID's just going to go away with the sun and we'll all be fine. Mm -hmm. Right. And you know, if that, you know, if that happens, then we won't even need to build this. Why, why would we, you know, spend millions probably on, you know, marketing and building it and, and doing all this stuff when we could just not spend that money, wait it out and we'd be fine. And sometimes when you're a startup, uh, you can you can sort of weather that right because you're just like you're building it on the side and it's like it's kind of kind of fun and um, it's not as as huge of a risk whereas if you if you lose millions inside of a larger organization you might have to pay for that with you know layoffs or something like that so um, so it, it, it's been it's been really interesting I mean you have to be very scrappy uh, just like a regular regular entrepreneur. Um, you've got to build things fast. You've got to focus on the minimum viable product, which everybody knows what MVPs are mm -hmm. now. Um, but it's really just focusing on what can bring the most value for, for your buck. Uh, I think a lot of times people think that larger organizations, it's full of, full of waste. Um, and that's very, very true. Um, but in the, in this particular situation, I mean, we, you, you kind of have to be, um, you know, as scrappy uh, as possible, just like a, like a regular startup. Sounds sweet. Um, so I do have some more questions, but before I get to those, uh, let me leave it open to anyone to ask a question right now. Got one. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so I don't believe we've met, uh, but I'm Lou Thompson, the CEO of Action VFX. So thanks for joining, giving us some of that awesome knowledge. Thanks. Um, my question would be, uh, do you currently utilize any, and I would say I'm from a non-technical background when it comes to like actual development. Mm -hmm. um, do you currently use any like low or no code platforms? And do you kind of see if so, or if you don't, do you kind of see that being useful in the future when those kind of develop further to being able to kind of harness and, and do things faster from a developer's perspective? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so we, we, did, we didn't on this particular one. Um, so we reused some, some pieces from other, uh, other apps that we had to kind of get things started. And one of the big, um, the big things with our products is there's tons of integrations uh, between the different products and how those sort of are, are inter interconnected. Uh, so we, we're building everything um, with, I guess, your traditional, traditional code. Um, but it's, it's really interesting to me, the, the sort of growth of all of these no or low code uh, solutions, because whenever I first started doing software development, like 15 years ago or something, for the first three years, all of my projects were literally access databases from like random people in the company who were just like, they had a problem, right? And they loaded up access, they built a form and they started storing data in it. And then they built a report on top of it or Excel something. And they used that for, you know, three or four, four years until finally they were like, we should probably 
figure out how to pull this in with this other system. And then at that point, it becomes like a real project. But really, I mean, it had been, it had been chugging along, providing tons of value um, for, for a long time. And I think that's, that's a key part of, you know, software and, and, and technology. It, it feels new and, and exciting uh, now because everything's on the web. You can build really great apps and experiences. Um, but that's kind of been going on for a really long time and, uh, and it's important. So I'm all for it. Uh, there are, I'm sure there'll be a lot of places where that, um, that, that pops up and we'll, we'll use it as we, as, as we find places to do that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's awesome and awesome and exciting part of, of tech right now. Awesome. Thank you. I have a question. I haven't had uh, a real job inside a, uh, company for like 15 years or so. So um, my question comes from Seth Godin's book, um, What to Do When It's Your Turn and It's Always Your Turn. And there's a really good section in here on My Boss Won't Let Me. Mm. And uh, there's two top things are to give credit and take blame. Um, would you agree as an entrepreneur that uh, that that strategy works for you? And if it doesn't, what do you do to get permission uh, to go off and do your own thing? Yeah. Um, so I think, yes, yes, definitely. Both of those things are, are hugely important. Um, the, the winning of the ship it projects, um, man, the, the way that we won is because we had a great team and every single, every single year that we won went back to the same exact people and uh, it was just, it was just su super awesome. And um, being, opti being optimistic and giving credit uh, to people is, again, it builds relationships with people. And if you want to build anything, it, right, it's like if you want to go, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Uh, if you want to build anything that's meaningful and big and lasting, you have to go as a team. And the only way that you can do that is to build good relationships and that's giving credit and taking, taking blame and, uh, and really any sort of like taking blame is really an opportunity for you, you to grow, um, any sort of issues that you, that you may have. And that's just sort of, it just comes with the territory of, I mean, entrepreneurship, if that's a thing, right? Like entrepreneurs, you fail fast, you learn from it and you use that to integrate and make a better product um and the same thing goes with yourself right like taking blame don't don't think of that as um you know i'm i, I have an issue or whatever it's just an opportunity to to be able to learn um and what was the second part of your question that you asked uh if you how do you get permission if you can't oh like, yeah you know like getting permission from a boss to to go do something, um, it can be tough. And yeah, what are some tips you've learned on how to get stuff done within an organization. Right. Yeah. So um, I think I think at the end of the day, if you're working at uh, a business, right? Like the business's goal is to make money, right? And yes, provide value to to your customers, but also to be able to just just make money as an organization and continue on. Uh, right. Like that's the catalyst for you being, being here next year and the year after that. Um, and, uh, air, air organization, we're a big payments company. We're like, I think next quarter we'll be in the fortune 500. Like we're, we're huge. And there's a big focus on growth. And I've always been leery of like growth for the sake of growth. I'm like, Oh, grow, you know, like, why can't we just focus on the customers? Why can't we just like, like bring value to people? Like everything will sort itself out. Um, and then, uh, one guy in the organization, uh, said something that really stuck, stuck with me, which was if you're not growing, you're shrinking. Uh, and so we always need to be focused on, uh, on growing because if we ever sit on our laurels and, uh, just say like, all right, this is as big as the businesses I want, want to get, I'm not going to go after new customers or not going to do, do new things, then, uh, then you'll end up shrinking. But coming back to, asking for permission i think focusing on what is good for the customer and the business and showing showing your 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 particular manager or the people over you or whoever you know could give you permission um showing them that you're focused on the customer 
uh, gives you more opportunities. So I'll give you an example. Uh, so in software development, there's tons of new shiny technology all the time, right? There's like new stuff coming out. And as soon as a framework comes out, you start building something on it. And then now it's like not the cool thing anymore. Okay. Um, and Air, Air app has been, it's been in existence for like 10 years, but I think as it is on the current, current tech stack, it's like five, five or six. And it's been really tempting a lot of times to add in new particular um, new technologies because they're, you know, quote unquote exciting. Um, but I think w one of, one of the things that I've learned over time and, um, and, and try to do is to, to think about the people and not just uh, the software. And so I make decisions that are good for the business and for us long-term, as opposed to purely for like what I, I feel at the time or resume driven development or, or, or whatever. Right. Um, and because, because I'm able to do that and focus on what's good for the business, then it gives the people who aren't developers or, you know, in other parts of the organization or, or who manage, you know, the, the million billion dollar accounts uh, to know that these particular people are really focused on the business. So, I can listen to them and trust trust their decisions and know that they've you know done the work ahead of time to know that you know this isn't something like I don't want to just build this thing because I have this really cool idea like I think it'll be fun like we should we should go do this um, it's really like um, if you focus on focus on the business it gives you more opportunities um, to be able to do things like that. So kind of going on those same lines, when it, I, I guess some of the corporate environments that I've you know, been a contractor in and seen, uh, they sometimes their innovation group or their entrepreneurial group uh, was always kind of separated and they kind of did their own thing. Mm -hmm. And it was almost them versus everybody else or not, not versus, but it was just, it was just separate. They weren't seen as part of the core team. Mm -hmm. um, for your company, is, is that is the, the innovation side to that built right into the beginning? And how important do you think it is to have a um, kind of buy-in from the leadership on down to the managers, down to the employees? Yeah. Um, so, so I work on a team called the strategic team, which is kind of like an internal floater team. Um, a lot of times companies will do, uh, well, you know, hire out a, out a contractor team to augment their, their existing team. We're sort of that internally and we work on special projects. Uh, and so we are, I guess, sort of technically like the innovation team of sorts. Um, but I, I, I've never felt like we, any sort of innovation is exclusive to our team. Um, and our leadership has made, made that uh, pretty clear, not like overtly clear, but um, I've never felt like, like, this is, this is the innovation team and these people do not innovative, innovative things. Um, so, so it, yes, we're a separate team, but really innovation is everyone's job. And I think a lot of times we, we sort of focus on like, what, what is innovation? And, oh, it's, it's like, uh, we go in a hole for six months and we come out with this big, super shiny feature. Um, but really innovation isn't, big, big things. A lot of time, particularly in lar larger organizations, it's really small adjustments over time. Uh, and I think th this past week I was in, um, some meeting with somebody at work and there was an example, um, of a slice in golf, right? Like, so if you shoot straight down the fairway versus something where you slice it and it goes, goes off into the woods, the difference in your club, like when you hit it is like two millimeters, right? It's, it's a very, very small adjustment, but when you look at the trajectory of where the ball goes over time, um, it's a huge difference. And so really it's about, uh, innovation at the, the entire organization. Yes. Like I get to work on this, this, this really fun, cool project. Um, but if you make it so obvious that like, these are the innovator teams, like this is an entrepreneur or entrepreneur, or this is the person who does the innovation. 
um, I think that's a big disservice to a huge portion of the arguably may, maybe even more impactful innovation that's happening inside of an organization, which is really just saying we don't need to make new things all the time, but if we can make really important small adjustments, like watch the details, make sure that, you know, tighten up, tighten up the corners every once in a while, uh, make sure that we're focused on, you know, the two millimeter adjustments over the long term. that really adds polish and it can, it really changes the, the trajectory of, of your organization over time. I had a question. Yep. All right. So I just finished reading the five day turnaround um, by Jeff Hillmeyer. It's actually on entrepreneurship, but it was also recommended to me uh, because he ran startups and now ran, runs his division like a startup. And in it, he was talking about how it's important to have your in your team within the company, your purpose, vision, tenants, value statement, and then run everything off of that in a team vision board. Um, do you do something similar with your team within your company? Yeah, so um, so we, our, our organization is very, very, very large. Um, and so they, of course, have, have value, uh, you know, a value system and, and vision. And we do that, we do that in our, in school solutions. Um, we don't necessarily do that, uh, do that at the individual team level, like the two pizza team sized level um, where, where I'm at. Uh, but yes, we all, we all align. Um, we do, uh, you know, OKRs and try to make sure that um, we always know whatever it is that we're working on or focusing on. Um, we know how that rolls up to, to the big picture. Um, and that's helped a, a ton OKRs in general. If you're not familiar with what OKRs are, um, it's objectives and key results. Um, and so everybody has an objective for, for the quarter and then some very more, more specific key results of things that you are going to accomplish, um, you know, that quarter in order to say that I've achieved my objective, like, um, making sure that our organization is innovative. Like, how are you going to do that? Um, here's some specific things we're going to do ship it. We're going to, um, I'm going to have meetings to talk about, you know, customer service or cross pollinate. Uh, individuals and so uh, so yeah with with the with the value system uh, it, it we're very intentional about making sure that everyone no matter where you are in the organization um, has a relationship with with other people and knows how your your little tiny piece of uh, of the world fits in with the larger larger organization and larger world um, and that helps you feel more like a team for sure. Um, but it also helps, helps you sort of see that your, your objective uh, for the quarter aligns with all of these other people. And you're like, Oh, we're kind of, even though I'm doing, you know, working on this meal ordering thing, you know, this person way over here in customer service is really has the, ex the exact same objective, which is to help schools figure out how they're going to do COVID in the fall. And since we're working on the same objective, I can just talk, go talk to her and say, Hey, you know, we're working on the same thing. Really? Um, let's, let's, let's do this. Um, and so, uh, yeah, having, having strong teams and having, uh, an understanding that you're all working towards the same thing is really important. I've got a question. Yeah. Okay. You all froze there for a second. Oh. Um, so I know you've done the, uh, the whole entrepreneur thing. You've had your own business and all that stuff. Um, so how do they structure something like this so that it feels real and not like you're drinking the Kool-Aid and, and that it's actually valuable? Yeah. Does that make sense? Sort of. Yeah. So like, as opposed to like, all right, you, you just get, like this list of stories or like things that you need to work on for the week and like, okay, here's your things of things to work on for the week. Like how is that different than any other? Well, like uh, as, as when you own your own business or whatever, like, uh, yeah. you know, we're, we're, there's, there's the upside of this could really pay off in the end. How do they 
create that value. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. So really like the mo- the motivational um, yeah. sort of, yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's it's sort of the same, but um, the the win the wins and the heartaches are sort of not not as pronounced, right? Because if you're an entrepreneur and you spend all all of your time, and a lot of times you spend your own money, right? The downside is potentially extremely hurtful to you and your your family, right? Um, but the upside, if you if if you're successful. There's, there's huge upside to you. So the, uh, you know, the bottom and the top are a little bit more, more squished. Um, but I think, I think it's a really, really great opportunity, particularly for me. Like I, I really love building new products. Um, but also if you have any sort of um, care about moving up in an organization, the best way to do that is to grow the organization, right? Like you want your, your boss to get uh, more responsibility and have more people under them and their boss the same and all that kind of stuff. And as you grow in that, you sort of naturally build new positions. And so um, having a, a totally new product, of course, is going to need more developers if it's, if it's successful. Um, we grow and really everybody's salary is paid by successful products. Um, and so it's an opportunity for me to be able to, um, affect the organization more than just regular, regular everyday stuff. Um, and then also they keep sort of, um, uh, kind of mentioning the, the roadmap of like where this, this goes. And I don't know that I can really like discuss roadmap stuff, but, um, it's really important to have to, like I was saying, grow, if you're not growing, you're shrinking and to, to be able to be on, um, a a new greenfield project is really one of the places as a developer to be able to try new, try new things. Um, and since it's totally greenfield, we can try a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of new stuff. So it sounds like they're pretty transparent about certain yeah. plans and, and aspirations. Yeah. Yeah. That's so that goes kind of back to the, one of the reasons why I think that, um, in entrepreneurship, right. Uh, in, in my organization right now specifically, um, it works so well. It isn't about like saying that we're going to be innovative or whatever. It's really giving, people the opportunity to naturally make better decisions. And if you keep people siloed um, and just say like, here's the thing that you're going to be working on today, like do this thing, like exactly how I say it. um, It's hard to be innovative with that. Whereas if you, um, if you're open about not just the roadmap, but you know, financials and what marketing is going to be doing and uh, issues potentially in customer service because that sort of ties into it too. Like we build a new thing, right? Like we're going to have to have other people in customer service to support it. We want to make their lives easier too. And so having open relationships and cross pollinating people and making sure that um, you're intentional about uh, if you give somebody a project, um, trying to sort of have people work on things across departments uh, fairly frequently to build those relationships so that they have people to, um, to just naturally, uh, talk with and make better decisions. Um, so it's really about op- openness and relationships and being intentional about that, that naturally makes innovation, uh, happen as opposed to just saying like, we're going to be innovative. No, that's, that's good. I do have a question. It's like one, one thing I feel like I deal with a lot in this season of, owning a company is I see so many opportunities out there, right? Like different things that we could pursue, different ideas, but it's like, well, we can't do everything. You know, that's, that can't work. We're a small company still. We have limited resources, limited time. And I still, you know, try to explore, you know, what would it like be like to just bring an entrepreneur into the company and just say, Hey, you know, here's this thing. I think that would be cool. Can you just go make it in the corner right here? And we can just, that's called an acquisition road. (laughs) Well, 
<laughs> Let me finish. Acquisitions are great, except for the fact that you need a lot of money, usually, right? So I guess the question I have is, what would you say are some traits of entrepreneurs that you would advise someone to look for as to someone that would have the ability to take on a new project and kind of make it their own within an organization? What are the traits of the successful entrepreneur? Gotcha. Um, I would say uh, well-rounded in their experience. Um, so, and really that's, that's the main that's the main one. Um, I think a lot of times if you're, if you're siloed and you understand like, and for me, like if you understand the technology, but you don't understand the business, then you can make good technology decisions that are terrible business decisions. Right. Um, and I think having somebody who is good at building the thing so they can execute well, number one, um, but also, understand is well-rounded enough to understand understand and make good dis, good business decisions along the way um, or at least knows that they're not good enough at something to ask for help and have relationships with people who can who can step in and and fill those gaps uh, I think that's that's important for entrepreneurs and and entrepreneurs both um, and that's for sure I think the the the, the best trait No, short and concise. That's great. And that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Are there any other questions? No. You're muted. There you go. Yeah, I know. I just unmuted. So one last question. Yeah. So let's say you have a friend in a company and they be, and they want to solve a problem but are unable to but not due to the company's end, but they don't have, they don't think they can do it. What are some, what's some advice you could give to that person to say, hey, here's how you can develop the idea and then broach it to management for you to try this project? Yeah, um, so if it's, if it's a software company, which is what I'm, I'm used to, right? Um, and the ship it's and internal hackathons are really, really great opportunities to flesh out those, those types of, of ideas. Um, and so we're in, in Heartland, we're, we're lucky enough to, to have that sort of opportunity. So it's, it's yearly. So once a year, if we have some sort of like, you know, crazy idea, uh, we can, we can build it, build it then. If you don't have one, um, I think just like a regular startup would be, if you don't have if you don't have a prototype, uh, you should try to build one. And if you can't, you need to know know your numbers and do do all of the research around it, um, so that whoever, if you really want it to happen, um, and whoever you're wanting to pitch it to that can actually make it happen, uh, then make sure that. You get every all do all your research, get your numbers together, know if you if you need to make a prototype, how much that would cost, um, potential return, you know, market size, all that kind of stuff, right? And get that together just like a startup would, uh, and and present that because that's really that's how s startup businesses are born, and it's really it's really it's at some point if somebody has money. And they want to be able to spend the money and get back more money than they spent, right? It's return on investment every time. Like that's what it boils down to. Uh, and if you can, if you can do that to show that it's, it's a good return on your investment, then that's, that's the best approach. If you, uh, if you don't have a prototype. Everybody needs to learn how to pitch. Everybody needs to learn how to stand up in front of a group and try to sway their opinion. That's it. And they need to teach that every step of the way in inside business and outside business. Yeah. That's a, uh, I was just going to say like the, uh, I used to be terrible at, at public speaking and I'm still not su super great. Um, but the, the reason that I'm better now is that 
uh, I started giving talks at our .NET user group, right, like 10 years ago, just five or six people and just giving talks on whatever, whatever it is that you, that you, that you do. Like, I'm not, I'm not a world renowned entrepreneur expert, right? But I know, I know enough about it because I do it, do it on, in my day job. And, um, and it's sort of what, what I kind of live. So I'm comfortable speaking with it. And, um, and every time that I give, give a talk on whatever it is that I'm learning at, you know, at TriDev or, or here, you know, you get a little bit better. And, uh, it's, it's definitely given me, speaking has definitely given me more, more opportunities personally. Um, but it also makes sure that if there, if, and when there comes a time when I need to pitch something and I actually really need it to need something to happen that I'll be ready for it. I was going to say, it's, it's so interesting how, you know, a lot of times in the startup world, people have ideas and it's like, Oh, I've got this idea. It should just happen for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but just like in kind of the entrepreneurship world, what you guys do, you still have to do all of the legwork to make it into basically a business. It has to have a lot of validation and things thought out. Uh, but that did raise a question of how in the near world, how do they actually motivate or reward and incentivize you guys to do these things? Because I could see a lot of people at home thinking, well, if I'm going to create this great thing for this company, I want it to make me rich or I want it to, I want to benefit from it, not just doing it so what, what do they do to incentivize and encourage and make it happen yeah um so uh for our, our ship at hackathon there's of course like monetary rewards which is why i have a decent camera and a decent mic in my office is because we, we won a couple times um so there's that obviously but um our our executive leadership and uh you know management are are super great about giving just recommend uh uh, giving recognition to to people every day along along the way. Uh, they're very consistent about it, um, and not just like when something something uh, big big happens. Um, and I think another thing is really uh, really sort of the mindset that the sort of cross pollination and relationships within our organization help to bring out, which is. Uh, um, just having an awareness of, you know, like the numbers and, uh, a growth, growth mindset. So if, if anybody has any sort of like career aspirations, like I was saying before, uh, in order for a position to open, either somebody has to like leave the organization and we have very, very low turnover, um, which is, so it's probably not going to happen. Um, or somebody like retire or, the organization grows. And so the best way that you can grow your salary, your opportunity internally and in a company to be able to work on uh, new cool projects um, is to really just grow the organization, which grows your opportunities as, to, as an individual. And, um, and when, you, when you're successful in some sort of project in, internally, uh, you know, an entrepreneurial, I guess, project or any sort of inter innovation, uh, that of course gets you individually recognized uh, for uh, f for you know doing doing that or being being a part of it, and you can be successful by of course like running your numbers, making sure that the decisions that you make within the context of the decisions that people above you make um, benefit the business, um, are smart decisions, bring value to your to your customer every single day. Um, and that really gets noticed. I mean, in any organization, really. Um, so it's just just that visibility and and and, and focus, and then uh, recognition in return. Sweet. Well, hey, this was awesome, guys. Thank you once again, Ryan, for joining us and dropping some knowledge bombs on us all. <laughs> <laughs> I love how both you and Jose did that <laughs> at the same time. But no, this has been great. And as David mentioned before we started, feel free to keep hanging out and just chatting and stuff for if you want to respect everyone's time and officially wrap up this month's Founders Meetup. So thank you once again, Ryan, and thank you for all the questions. This really kept the 
conversation going, which was awesome. Yeah, but, thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure, this was great. So until next time, y'all. Thanks, y'all. See you guys may, later. May the force be with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.